Well, I'd uh, like to call this finance committee meeting to order. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. The first item we have is uh, assignment for request for council action. Uh, uh, many items for the finance committee, 17166 budget amendments, 17167 job creation grant, number JCG15 Fire Dex LLC, 17168 job creation grant, number JCG16 <coughs> Echelon Independent Living Operations, 17169 job creation grant, number JCG17 Echelon Assisted Living Operations, 17170 agreement with Arcadis install monitoring law 301 South Court Street, 17171 expenditure over 15,000 for Labyrinth Management Group, 17172 adoption of TIF ordinance revenue sharing agreement and TIF parcels, 17173 adopt 2017 Ohio Building Code section 1335, 17174 adopt 2017 Ohio Plumbing Code section 13. 45, 17175 net profit tax grant incentive for local businesses, 17176 discuss tree issues, city sidewalk program, 17177 establish mandatory retirement age for police and fire personnel, <coughs> and 17178 accept a warranty deed. First item is 1747 West Liberty parking structure preliminary budget. Patrick? Uh, this will bring you back, but we submitted this originally earlier this spring um, for the recent development. <coughs> the uh, TIF funding of the school board, um, we wanted to move forward with establishing a budget uh, so that Kimberly can submit the proof of that to the state um, in order for us to, to verify the grant, the $1 million state grant. Um, so the budget still is a million dollar for the grant and about two point five million dollars uh, advance from the city. I guess you can call it what you want, advance loan, but we try to get it paid back through the TIF ordinance. The one thing that I was uh, thinking about that maybe we didn't look at or maybe we should look at when we do the parking deck um, in the advent of all these electric cars is there? I think the state sometimes gives you free money to add electric uh, hookups in the deck for electric cars. Is that, money. is that something we want to look at? I mean, because we're going that way. The only reason I asked because I was out this weekend, I saw a Tesla and I talked about it with a guy and it's electric and there's more electric cars. Do you think that we should be progressive and do that and have a couple of hookups and a deck, possibly through a grant through the state? I don't know of any grants, but we can research it. I do like the idea. I guess part of we'll have to look at the design. I don't know. But it's pretty common. I know talking to some of these contractors. They brought that up to me to probably more and more, I don't know, I want to say every single deck, but more and more frequently they're putting those power stations in or whatever have you in, in parking lots. <laughs> Yeah, if it, I mean, if we can find a way to do it that doesn't cost us money, and I know that they, uh, the, some of them I saw are operated by credit card, where you just plug it in and pay for, and I don't think it's that much, but maybe we should look into that while we're doing this to see if we should do a couple of them. Maybe through NOAC, or I don't know, do they have a cover of funding for stuff like that? I don't know. Okay. I know they're trying to push that because it's energy efficient. And but what if it increases the cost? Are we still going to... I can't imagine it increases the cost of the deck because it's just an add-on yeah. with an electric line. You add them onto existing decks, I would imagine. So if we're going to put lay electric down, even if we don't have it, maybe we should just lay the, the, the ability to have it if we wanted to do it. Can we use the... Uh, yeah. The electric uh, charge, uh, fees that would be charged to use electricity to help pay this back, help pay for the installation of it. Help sure, I don't know if there's going to be a, 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 I Initially, know. I don't think there'll be a lot, but I think more and more people are using electric cars, and if that's an option for them, it might be something worthwhile trying, I guess. You start you with the penny off of the lights. Right, does it, does it have to be there? I mean, we don't, if we don't have the station there, you can always put the leads in to have the ability to be connected, and why not if you're pouring the cement, it can't be that much more money to put the pipe in. Yeah, you would think, and, it, and that'd be conduit for future use when we all. Right. So if you could look at that too, that'll be great. I, I mean, I think, do you guys agree? Do you guys think that'd be a good idea to try to Is that 110 or? I have no idea. Patrick, do you know? Is it 110? Usually? Is that something where, that would end up taking a full space for a whole day, or is it something where you pull in and charge it and a couple of hours later you move it well That's as long way. as you're there i mean i guess if you have an electric car you park it somewhere right and when you park it in your spot you could hook it up to electric and charge it while you're there and then when you leave 
You only pay for what you use, I assume, of how long you charge. I, but but you would be able to park in that spot if you didn't have an electric car. Right. Yes, yeah, so it's not you wouldn't lose the spot. Right. But I mean, it would be reserved if you had an electric car to get first right. priority. But I mean, if it's a packed night, I'm sure people aren't going to listen. Right. To that. So it's an option. So when we send this grant packet down, they have to answer within 30 to 60 days. So that gives us some time to evaluate it. Yeah. We'll do that. Sure. Okay. Can you give us, anybody else any questions on that? We can talk about it more now about the TIF ordinance related to it, or if we can wait to the TIF ordinance, probably if you'd like. We wait to the TIF ordinance. Okay. Patrick, thanks. Thank you. Um, the next time we have is 17166 budget amendments. The first one we have is 2017-31 holiday lighting. Ooh. This is the uh, portion of it that was come out of ag electric aggregation funds. We're appropriating that. Oh, okay. Questions? Move to approve. Second. We need a resolution. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Hey, John, let's go back. Oh. We need a resolution to go with the grant packet that the council has established this budget. Yes. Not that just you're, you're Oh, okay sorry. <laughs> so you need a resolution to say. Yes. Oh. All right. Uh, then we're going to commit that two and a half with the one million dollar grant yeah. to do the All right. project. Oh, gotcha. They need to see that they to free up the million dollars. Gotcha. So Which goes along. Clause with that also? I'm sorry. Do we also need the emergency clause with that? So that because we want to submit the paperwork mid October. Well, it would seem that you would. Right. <laughs> when we talk about thirty that days. Well, I just wasn't sure. Like, if you do that. Only for ordinances, or is it ordinances and resolutions? I got you. It would be, it would be for both. Okay. Mark, we were talking about item number one or two. Request for council action is one. Okay. Regarding the West Liberty parking structure to preliminary budget, Patrick, it's the same thing we looked before. The million dollar grant with two and a half million dollars um, advanced from the city to be reimbursed through the TIF. Uh, so that's where we're at right now, and they need a resolution from council saying that. We support that in order to get the grant. So that's why well, so, well, we're the committed. Course, we're committed, correct. Right. Good. So while the paperwork's being processed at the state, we're also going to look at um, whether there are grants or um, other options available for plug in for electric cars with the growing popularity of that as well. And whether we could do that without adding additional costs to the city. And if there was additional costs, what would that be? So now you're up to speed. Thanks. That's where we are right now. Okay. So, questions? Um, you guys already gone through? Well, we, we talked about voted yet. We have, we have, well, we haven't voted on a resolution of support yet. We voted on an understanding. I guess we didn't even vote at all. We didn't vote at all, we didn't vote at all for him. <laughs> so here we are. All right. So you're up. Why am I? We moved on, Mark, and then we realized they need a resolution. Oh, yeah, we didn't do anything. Well, I appreciate there. you guys holding up for me. I apologize for Um you guys know how I feel about this. I think, uh, one, uh, we can't afford it. Two, I know there's there's a TIF in place, but we still have upfront costs that we have to provide, which I think it's going to wear us really thin. And then when I look at other projects that could stimulate this city, um, I don't think an additional parking, jet, parking deck is the answer. I mean, I wanted us to focus more on the other parcel where the Huntington drive through is, but it seemed like that just got nothing really happened with that. And then we moved over here, and I just, I don't think it's our best option, but you know. Well, but I don't, I think we've talked about that. I don't think, I don't think a development on the other side of the street is going to happen <coughs> unless we have the parking. And you well, talk about stimulating the city. Yeah. All right. Um, as Kimberly pointed out earlier today, We've had five groundbreakings in the city in the past three or four months okay. of new business coming in, bringing in new uh, new employment, new tax dollars. You say five. Where are those, Paul? Let's see. I can think of four. So Fire Decks, Echelon, Senior Living Group did two groundbreakings, one for assisted living and memory care unit. One is for their independent living operations. The other one was for the... Uh, Dr. Lauren Raymond building, which is the former Chamber of Commerce site, and the one before that was the Carlisle Brake and Friction Company. Which are so great, are great things for the community. All within the last three months. But that's what I'm <coughs> trying to figure out. When we spend taxpayer money and we try to affect this entire <coughs> city, focusing on the uptown area when we already have a parking deck, and I know others feel differently, 
an additional one to me doesn't make sense when there's maybe other areas that maybe not spend all of them, but some to stimulate more, you know, we bring it up every other that north end of town where the project is. I mean, there's Kmart, I know there's a contract in place, but maybe there's something else that we can do to stimulate that area. Or the industrial park needs, to me, I, you know, other little things that might stimulate it compared to putting another parking deck uptown. Well, I would, so, I would agree um, with you on that. I think that I think we're hopefully something will happen with the Kmart Park. I mean, there's different things that could happen there. The one thing I think where I differ with your opinion is I believe that, you know, I, I wouldn't be for it if we were spending our own money and not getting reimbursed for it, and, or attempting to get reimbursed for it. But I, I believe that the TIF will reimburse us because I believe, from what we heard from the when we had the Masonic Temple here and they wanted to try to redo it, the biggest issue for the person to try to redo it was there was no parking for anything that happened there. And then, of course, they found out the costs associated with redoing it, and I think that hampered it a little bit and, and the condition of the Masonic Temple. But everybody we talked to, and even uh, other businesses and, and educational institutions, they want parking in order to do something here. They don't believe that there's an adequate number of parking, even with the current parking deck. Now, during the day, the current parking deck is not filled, of course. But this course. deck is not gonna solve that. And you know that. I mean, there's already enough that's gonna be on demand on this size deck already. I mean, it's not gonna solve that problem. You know, and, and that's where that other block comes into play. To me, the difference in cost of just having, I know some don't like a service lot, and we went over it again. But the difference in cost of space is gained. Um, Pat might have that I don't have in front of it, but doesn't to me it doesn't make sense well, just, don't so and then we're we're getting rid of some of our own property for something on Elmwood we're gonna end up selling and a section over on uh, where we have an existing parking lot that we put money into not too long ago and we're gonna sell those portions up portions off to make this happen which I understand but I just I just well I've always been the philosophy of that um, if you're in a downtown area it's better to have vertical parking rather than horizontal parking because the areas of horizontal parking want buildings and you want businesses or sure. other type of living units, hotels, apartments, educational facilities. In a downtown area, you want that. I mean, we've been told before that, you know, people objected to and they weren't too happy with the restrooms we put in there. But to me, that's been a fabulous success. We've had, I have more people say, this is great for people coming to Medina that don't live in Medina, they love it because they have a place to go. And it's convenient, it, bigger events, it's, a, a, it's very convenient for those events and more people want events because of it. And at the beginning of the restrooms, we all had a lot of people say, why are you guys doing that? This is crazy, you shouldn't be doing it, you're wasting money, and it came out to be a success. All right, well, and if you recall, I voted for getting the parcel. I voted uh, against the size of it because I wanted it to be a little less in size. I still wanted to function on that corner. Uh, and to me here, it's uh, similar. Not that, uh, you know, we have a parking deck, the third, or the top lot's not even used that much, besides large events. And, uh, you know, to me, I guess my vision of that uptown area and trying to spend money up there to stimulate, it's a little different than you guys. No, I, 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 I respect that. But, right, uh, no, I understand. I mean, you know, you have a building, the old Bank One building, they're trying to sell. You have a Huntington Bank that is still there at their main office, but who knows in their future? To me, those are great opportunities for apartment living mm -hmm. and getting something like that. And then, but I mean, the, to me, like I said, you know, we're trying to spend taxpayer money wisely. Everybody has a different vision on where money should spend, how much should be left for other projects, and. I just differ with you guys, and nothing against you. But and to, just, your, no, I, and really to your point it. there, if, if say, let's take your, your point that those two are great apartment living opportunities. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're going to need a place to park. There's no other parking uh, in the area. Yeah, we've got the parking deck on the, the east side of the square. For the people at the Huntington Bank, they're going to need a place to go and park their cars. Mm -hmm. Okay, plus with the anticipated living quarters that um, are talked about being built over the current parking lot now and if some of those other f things come to fruition that we talked about at the bank one we're going to need more parking there we're building for the future that's part of our job here is to look for and the I future totally get if that you ball. build it they will come well, and that sounds all good uh, and i please i believe that you have to leverage yourself for the future but 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I fight with the, the same situation that you do, Mark, constantly, and I, I keep being brought back to uh, Dennis, as the mayor has said it several times in public speaking, several times to us individually. Even Mayor Lever, uh, God rest her soul, said this, the same thing. People, when you try to do something, we all know that the, the square has become the jewel of our city. I don't disagree that we need to, to pay attention to the north, south, east, and west of our city. I, and I, I think we all, as a group and administration, are doing that. But as, as these individuals said, we take things for granted. You know, we think the square is great. When you talk about the public restrooms, I don't know how many people said, you are wasting our taxpayer dollars on public restrooms. But they weren't people that were coming to visit the square, shop at the square, or come to events on the square. It was people that had lived here, and, and I could have easily spent the rest of my life not having public restrooms on the square. Uh, you know, and if I would have just been a citizen saying, yeah, no, we don't need that. I live down on the north side of town. I, I'm not going to use that. The same with our parks. We we spend so much money on our, our parks, and we've got the most fabulous parks. But if you don't use it, uh, it, it, it doesn't really make that much difference to you. And then people that don't use it don't really don't want any money spent in the parks. But the people that use it and the people that come in from out of town to our community have nothing but praise for our parks, for our uptown square, uh, our historic district. And I think every dollar we spend to try, you know, in the last couple of years, it's the first time in, in, that I can remember that most of our, if not all of our businesses on the square are full. Uh, if, they, if they become empty, they're not empty very long. Uh, and there's, as Kimberly says, and Jonathan has said, and the mayor has said, there's constantly more people that want to become part of our community, and whether it be the square or north, south of town, uh, I think our vision should be to, for me, to think of as a as a visitor to our community that is going to be a community that's going to entice me to want to move here and work here and use our churches and use our schools and use our health care facilities. We and, and everybody, whether they're visitors at the, the square, is the jewel of our city. So I do believe in, in using some of those city spaces and the chamber spaces and the spaces that you mentioned on on South Elmwood <clears throat> for creating new new property for businesses and housing. But to do that, we need parking on the west side of the square. So that's why I'm supporting. It. But I, I, I respect what you're saying. The things I just want to add, Mark, that's different, and I want to address it to you because I do appreciate what you're saying. I worry about it too with $2 million. But the thing I can't walk away from is that the state's willing to give us a million dollars. That means they believe in us. They feel like something good is happening here, and they think this is a worthwhile project. That's a lot of money to walk away from with a million dollar offer. I also think the TIF is a great way to minimize our risk with how to pay for it for our share. And I still think a parking deck is going to help not only this development, but it's going to help City Hall. It's going to help the courts. Whatever we do there, it will get used. So that's the reason I'm in favor of it. And I, I think I want to follow up what Jim said. I think when we looked at this, if we had to do this and use taxpayer dollars without a creative way or another way to get reimbursed, I think it, it would be a tougher decision for me. But with the, with the TIF in place, we still have a CRA downtown. And any developer who comes in downtown could use that CRA. What that means is that if they use the CRA, they can get an abatement of 100% up to 15 years. And even though we stagger it, that would mean no tax dollars coming in to, to help pay for a public improvement that we need to try to entice people. And I think I'd rather be on the side of, well, as looking from a developer's perspective, if I want to do a development, the, the most costly thing for developers is parking. And, if I'm a developer, I don't want to pay for parking. And so how can we as a city try to help people out solve that problem? And this is one way, and, if, and the fact that we have the TIF attached to it is one way where we can uh, seek reimbursement of those monies of the developer putting their money into the project and building the building and increasing the tax value of the parcel. We could use that to leverage. And I think our job should be to try to figure ways to leverage development and 
leverage income tax to come into the city and you know we could argue on each side of it but i think the, the side i fall on is this is a, a a great way to do it a smart way to do it and why wouldn't we do it that's 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 just my opinion on that anybody else have anything? Uh, you know i said it before I'm, I'm convinced that the development across the street is unlikely to happen unless we have the parking available and like john and jim said we've got a million dollars coming from the state like Jim said, I mean, that shows the state thinks we can make something happen with that. And to minimize that with the TIF funding, I just think it's, I think it would be prudent of us to uh, go ahead and support it. Okay. you have anything? Well, I don't know, we've said all this about, I don't know how many times we've had this discussion, and, a lot. and, and, and yeah, it is a lot, but you know, it's interesting because we had, we had a very similar kind of discussion that was circular discussion about the pool mm -hmm. and it started out in one way and it ended up kind of in, in in another way and it turned out to be successful and I agree with Mark Mark I agree with you on a lot of points because I'm no fan of parking decks and or parking lots either one you know because everybody's been to places that you want to go to and you will go no matter what you know if you have to park a mile away you will go you'll find a place to park but it, it appears to me that Paul said, you know, we're trying to work toward the future. And if we're wrong, I think the package that's been put together, all the points that have been made about our, the funding, <coughs> so minimize the fact that we will be wrong. You know, it, it, I, I don't see how this can be a, a, t a failure, that it won't drive the development. It, it won't drive the, the business across the street. It won't increase the tax base. It won't bring residents into town. I disagree that the downtown is, is you know, absolutely has to have it it's doing pretty good right now the way it is if it were up to me I would put the money that we have I would put the two million dollars into housing because I think the most critical issue that we have in this city is the housing in the older neighborhoods in, in town that are in desperate need of an infusion of, of money of grant money of assistance, <coughs> of maintenance, money people can put into maintenance of their homes. I think those are critical issues. But but what's been put together here by um, I don't see how this can not work for the for the downtown and development that we have we have discussed and discussed um, over these months. But I think it's a good it's a good discussion because it, it reminds me a lot about the pool. I think it was the same thing and it's good to hear all these all these issues and Mark you've been an important voice in this because it needs to be heard there are other places where money can go I hear about the Kmart all the time and I've explained the Kmart ever since Kmart left but you still hear about the Kmart because it's 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 like a it's like a, an open wound on you know that people see and they don't understand why we haven't done that and um, I hope that that you know eventually will it'll, it'll work its way out now I'm concerned about the Hawkins property being empty um, not a good example a lot of people are, are where I live anyway, are, are um, and beyond where I live, south of town. You know, I know go to go to Drug Mart now. Happy to have Drug Mart in a township because you can go there and pick up a lot of food that you can't get anymore because Hawkins is empty. I'm concerned that Hawkins being empty is going to have an impact on CVS and CVS being a standalone now all by itself. How's that going to work out? It used to be a drive-through bank across the street. Now it's one of those like loan places where you borrow money that you can never pay back. I think all those are legitimate concerns, and you raised all of them. But this one sort of stands off on its own. I mean, this one has has so much going for it that if this one, if this fails, if we if we invest this money and we have the grant money and we build the parking deck, and nothing happens, I think there will be an awful lot of you know very surprised people here. I mean, as John, well, John pointed out, we have a way to you know this this money is not like two and a half million out the window never to see again. We have to look at Kimberly then. Okay. Mr. President, <clears throat> I just want to reiterate to Council that we focused on the city-owned parcel because we control the land. Across the street, we only control a small piece of it. So to assemble all those properties, you have to get all those property owners to agree, and you know real estate are complex deals. That's not to say that we're not going to do that, but it's a lot more difficult and it's a lot more expensive to get purchase options on all of that and to get people to agree to even be willing to sell those properties. So yes, we're still going to do that, but this was kind of like the low hanging fruit to put the first piece of the puzzle together. So to Mark's point, he thought we were focusing on the, the South Liberty, if you will, 
And I know that we, we looked at that for the downtown strategic redevelopment plan. It's still a part of that. It's just that with the city owned property, we control that. And it's <coughs> easier to work with that when you control the land. So no, it is. It is. Let me just be clear, too. I was around when the first parking deck came in. I supported that. Um, I su been, been supportive of the Main Street. A lot of things we've done in the uptown area. I jumped ship on the bathroom again because it got out of uh, my comfort zone. Uh, but here, I mean, we have a parking deck that we're going to build, and it sounds like the demand for that parking deck will be, I mean, it's going to, the demand for that parking deck, the size of it, the demand around it, the, the new development, the court and everything, is the city hall. I mean, that, to me, it's going to fill up that parking lot. And then what about any new development? We keep talking about new development. What's going to happen then? Are they going to say, well, you don't have enough room in this, this parking deck that you built for additional uh, spaces that we need? I mean, is that going to be just, I mean, that's what I'm concerned with, too. So when we, Bill, you brought up some good points of different areas of the city. And when we're looking at this and we go back to the taxpayers soon, because we've spent all the money, and we're showing well we spend it here and here and there I, I just i just don't think it's the, the the best choice for us right now so i think mark brings up a good point but i, I think a couple of the developers we talked about um their belief is that the, the courts um Which we don't know about yet we don't even know what the well, gonna go. my point is they're going to use up that court that that parking space during the day when the majority of the people that would need it aren't are gone, the people that are used that are living in the in the hopeful new uh, apartments there would be there in the evening, so there wouldn't be. Um, I, I still think that uh, for the cost of this deck compared to a, a lot, even if we kept our our property and made that all surface area, and the cost to me makes more sense to put a lot in and to have that money for other other things that we need to help stimulate in this community instead of an additional parking deck. But I mean I know I've talked to you guys numerous times and I appreciate you taking the moments to hear probably my same story but uh, I'm ready to vote. But thank you. Okay. And we'll make the motion then to uh, pass a resolution on the three point five million dollar budget with one million coming from the state with the emergency clause. Second, so, so this is a resolution of support, Patrick. That's what it'll be called. Is that what you're looking for? For the, the state's looking for a resolution of support. Yes. Yes. Resolution of support. Okay. Yeah. They want so to be know a resolution that we're support. supporting the project and that we have the matching funds. Okay. Second, including the emergency clause. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Uh, Seventeen one sixty six. Going back to the uh, budget amendments. The first one was holiday lighting, um, and. I guess who's handling that? Who voted that one? Yeah, yeah we voted that one. Yeah, we voted. The second one is 17030, the refund. We got a refund, we just need to appropriate it to be able to spend the funds. And the refund came from a donation. Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 17032, donation for the engine house. This is a donation from the Van Up Foundation. We're going to um, need to spend the money. Okay. This is for additional. Repair. Oh, is the CDC money in there? Yeah. How much is it? No, this. I think this is just the Van Epps donation. I don't. So Sorry, where's the CDC donation that you got before the Van Epps donation? I think we already. I thought we already, already did. That. Did we do that? A couple I'm pretty sure yeah. we did. Oh, okay. you weren't here, were you? No. no. I don't know, John. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> but, but I thought this was an additional contribution. Yeah, this is a, this is a matching fund, matching uh, contribution. Fund. Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Just for clarification, Bill, that there was 5,000 from the CDC as well, right? Yeah, 5,000 from the CDC matched, matched by the Gen right. Yeah, 10,000 total. Right. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. 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 I can double check. Sure. I'm pretty sure we passed it. Sure sure we did. Yeah, I think we did. Yeah, I might not have been here. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? I'm just curious. 2017 paver sales for the bicentennial. This, um, well, this is to appropriate the money from the revenue account so that we can get uh, purchase orders to install the bricks. And the remaining funds from that will uh, go to the bicentennial committee. It should be approximately $8,000. Okay. Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 17167 job creation grant number JCG15 for the Fire Dex LLC. Thank you, Mr. President. 
This request is for the mayor to enter into a job creation grant agreement with FireDex for the purpose of expanding their facility at 780 South Progress Drive, creating 30 new full-time jobs by the to the city of Medina by the year 2021. This expansion is a 25,000 square foot addition, which will double the existing uh, size of their facility. It will have an investment of $2 million in this project um, and committed to 30 new full-time positions with new payroll of $840,000 and then the schedules there um, for 2019, 2020, 2021, uh, 10 new jobs for the over those three-year period. The agreement will provide fire decks with a grant up to 40% of new payroll taxes to the city of Medina for three years, so it's a three-year term, and we respectfully request approval of the job creation grant agreement subject to the law director's approval. All of you have received a draft agreement in your packet, and just as a reminder to council and the public, these grants are funded through non-income tax generated revenues. Thank you. Questions? Move to approve. Second. Mr. President, um, my daughter works for uh, fire decks, but I believe I can vote objectively here because I will apply the same criteria as for this one as I will the next two job creation grants. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. 7168 job creation grant number JCG 16 echelon independent living operations. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this request is for the mayor to enter into a job creation grant agreement with the Echelon um, of Medina slash Echelon Independent Living Operations for the purpose of constructing a 90 unit, 119,413 square foot independent living facility located at 629 North Huntington Street. Echelon Assisted Living Operations will have an investment of $15,500,000 in this project. They have committed to creating 25 new full-time uh, positions, and they're the typo on your RCA. It's actually 11 new part-time positions to the city of Medina by the year of 2020, uh, with new payroll at $895,000. And then there's uh, the schedule in there on how many they'll do in 2018 and 2019. The agreement will provide Echelon independent living operations with a grant up to 40% of new payroll taxes to the city of Medina. This is also a three-year term. Um, the ground, we did a ceremonial groundbreaking on Friday, September 22nd, and then we respectfully request the approval of the job creation grant agreement subject to the law director's approval. Everything in your packet is the draft. And then as a reminder to council and public, the job creation grants are paid for from non-income tax generated revenues. And Jeff, is Jeff Reisner here? Hi. Jeff is here if anybody has any questions about the project. Jeff, welcome. Yeah, thank you. I remember at the, at the uh, meeting we had, you talked a little bit. I, I mean, I thought it was a great story. If you could tell them what you're doing now. I mean, you were in Cahawla Falls, I believe, and now you're here, and that was a kind of a great story. Yeah. You know, I want to thank you for the, uh, the opportunity to apply for a job grant here for us to be able to we think about the growth of our city here and be able to ultimately to attract, to retain, to enhance and enrich the quality of the lives of our, of our staff. And uh, ultimately it's a win-win for everybody, right? For our city and for our community, for our seniors as it pertains to us specifically uh, for our independent living. The second phase of this of this meeting today is our assisted living two grant, which we're we're asking uh, for as well. But uh, yeah, so yeah, we're uh, you know our, our our story is wanting to provide a, a quality of life for our seniors here in Medina that's uh, you know superior to anything that that uh, that they have available to them today uh, from a physical aspect, but more importantly. Uh, an emotional and a, a physical care aspect of caring for them above and beyond too. So that's our model in relation to uh, the independent to the assisted living and providing uh, uh, health care for them and access to services, whether it be amenities with a therapy pool or it would be a bistro or a pub or a, uh, a workout facility within, within our facilities to enhance the quality of their life. So. Um, in general, that, that first building, like uh, 
uh, Kimberly says almost 118,000 square feet, three story. The second building is at 83,000 square foot assisted living uh, uh, operations there. So yeah, we're we're uh, it's pretty dusty over there right now. So uh, you know as dry as it is, so we're throwing a lot of dirt right now as we're moving pretty quickly through the project. Uh, you know, with getting the pad ready for the IL right now. So. And your personal story too about your move. I thought that was kind of. Oh yeah, you know too. My wife and I, yeah. So we wanted to be a part of the community <coughs> above and beyond just being part of our business and the operations here to buying a, a condo here. So we're in the the throes of that right now to being a part of the city uh, in a greater way. So mm -hmm. we're uh, we're really excited about that. We currently live in Aurora. Nothing wrong with Aurora, but. Uh, uh, Medina just uh, kind of speaks to our spirit probably and that you know here in like the town square it is the jewel it's a it's a really a sweet uh, aspect of the ambiance of the community that that we all like to be able to walk to or participate in or go to a restaurant or a wine bar or a coffee and all those great things so for our seniors as well being just two blocks off of Maine here for us or three blocks it is uh, to, for them to be able to enjoy that as well so it's really strategic for us, uh, you know, even above and beyond uh, what we do because of the location of our, our facility. So. Well, we appreciate all you have done or are going to do. <coughs> yeah. Hopefully we have a prosperous future with us, and, yeah. you know, we, we look forward to that. Thank you. Likewise, look forward to being friends with everyone. So we'll have you over as soon as we're open and uh, enjoy some great food and whatever uh, else comes with all that cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I just, I'd again, like to welcome you. And, and Thank you. Two things. One, I, I think whoever is doing your construction, they've done a nice job of keeping the the area maintained and the streets cleaned. I, you know, I, I'm sure the the neighborhood appreciates that. Secondly, one of the the girls that's on your staff, I'm not sure what staff, but it was uptown, and and she recognized me from the first groundbreaking, and uh, she says, "Oh, you know, we're thanks for coming. We're having another one this coming, you know, this this week, a couple days ago." She said, the only thing I, you know, I, I don't like to complain, but I'm really disappointed that you're changing the color of the fire station. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm sure a lot of people have heard. This. Yes. They, they're they repainting the, the front of the fire station. They put a, I believe it, I'm colorblind, but I believe it was a gray right. primer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is up not only her, but upset quite a few people. Uh, and I know the, the gentleman that's doing the painting, he says, I heard so much about it that I finally told him that it was it was the mayor and Nino's decision. <laughs> <laughs> but it is red, and, and so you can assure your staff that the firehouse is red against. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mayor, I told everybody it was just Nino's decision. <laughs> 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 All right, any, uh, any further discussion? Actually, that primer is some kind of special paint mm -hmm. that will hold the red paint better. Good. Yeah, Good. and that's the that was the purpose of that. that there you go, I learned something. Yeah. Okay. Right. Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. And again, the next one is kind of related to it. 17169, the job creation grant number JCG17 Echelon Assisted Living Operations, which is adjacent to the independent living operations. So thank you, Mr. President. Um, this request is for the mayor to enter into a job creation grant agreement with Echelon of Medina slash Echelon Assisted Living Operations. LLC for the purpose of constructing a 98 bed, 80,675 square foot assisted living and memory care facility located at 635 North Huntington Street. Echelon Assisted Living will have an investment of $12,250,000 in this project. Uh, they have committed to creating 63 new full-time positions and 27 new part-time positions to the city of Medina by the year of 2020 with new payroll of 1.9 million uh, with the following schedule over uh, they'll be ramping up fairly quickly in 2018 with most of the hiring and then additional hiring in 2019 so you have that on your rca there <coughs> this agreement will provide echelon assisted living operations with the grant up to 40 percent of new payroll taxes to the city of medina for four years um, as we discussed, that we uh, have already done a groundbreaking and they've done some site work there. We do respectfully request approval of the job creation grant agreement subject to the law director's approval. All of you received a draft in your packet. Um, as a reminder to council and public, the job creation grants are paid for in non-income tax generated revenues. And just to note, 
that both of these projects together, and you can see the investment is pretty impressive, and I think the two projects will really transform that neighborhood along with the Clover Construction Department. So a lot of investment happening in Ward 1. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any other questions? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Th thanks for coming tonight. Thank you. Hopefully you stay. Right. This is great. We have a lot of time. <laughs> 17170, authorized agreement with Atreides for installed monitoring wall at 301 South Court Street. Patrick? Thank you. We were approached by Arcadis. They're a consulting firm. They're doing an environmental investigation. Hi, Jeff. At the former BP service station at 301 South Court that's now Busy B Muffler. They'd like to install a monitoring well uh, at 301 South Court, which is the city's parking lot. We own that parcel. Uh, monitoring wells in conjunction with their study of a potentially leaking underground storage tank at that, what is now Busy B. Um, I've been aware of, for probably going back a decade, they've been studying this and they've got monitoring wells in the area of different spaces. Uh, apparently they need another one. That's why they're asking us for permission to install this well. The well itself is basically just a, a plastic pipe, be 15 or 20 foot in the ground, <coughs> eight inches in diameter. It will be in there for a couple of years until this year of underground storage tanks at the state tell them maybe they can remove it. Um, they, if you read their letter, they're asking for one of two places, uh, either in the grassy area, which I think is our preferred, in the middle, or if it's, it has to be in the parking lot, they've got a specific spot. But anyhow, this is just to give them permission to install this monitoring. Questions on it? So Patrick, the reason that we've never heard about this before is because on the other wells, they're on private property, I take it. It's on private property, and actually there's one, and, and in conjunction with this, there will be another, a second well in the city right away. Now we handle those administratively um, through our uh, right away permit. Um, but this would be on our city property. A right away permit would apply. Uh, that's why we had to bring it to you guys now. So Patrick, does anybody ever fix this problem or do they just study the expansion of the bloom as it continues to get bigger and bigger? <laughs> that's the idea. I, I, they, they're trying to quantify it. Seeing it's been, how far been it's 10 years, they haven't quantified it yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're, they're obviously widening their net here. Um, oh, it's, it's reassuring. <laughs> so the question is, when, as this normally goes, that um, since I guess BP oil is involved, that there is a remediation program that has to take place, which would probably mainly be groundwater infiltration and not soil removal, I would imagine, because I don't know how they're going to remove all that soil. It would be more groundwater so, contamination. Yeah that they would have to do whatever to, to uh, rectify the groundwater. When they're done with this, after a couple of years, they'll have to submit a report to the state, the buster, and as part of that, you know, if they do find it's done, they, they have to have some sort of remediation plan. I don't know what that is until it's done. But they're gonna, part of the agreement would be a total indemnity from BP to the city related to anything that happens with respect to the installation of the monitoring well and also the results of the monitoring. Little turning lingo there. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm just talking. I mean, they're they're going to protect us, meaning since they're going to be on our property, if there's any damage done as a result of installing the monitoring well, we'll be protected from that. And also, if there's any, well, the state will handle this. If there's any contamination that's found that needs to be remediated, of course, the city's not going to be responsible to spend their own money to fix the problem on our property. We would have BP do that. So it, is there a way we can add to the, the well i don't know what the agreement says i don't does the agreement provide and i guess i didn't read it close enough that it was attached there pretty much just allows them to give site access um, and then a long it does say section. It does say any damage to your property that may occur as a result of the soil sampling on your property will be repaired to pre-drilling conditions including professional repair of the holes created in the asphalt parking lot mm -hmm if they do it there. But it sounds like you want another provision to, oh wait, hold on. Well, they, well in the release they do say under here, they, they provide that um, the undersigned waves and releases just, and discharges the owner, which is us, I guess. Is it the owner? Consultant owner, well, we would be the owner. In the second of the last paragraph, John says, um, 
BP and Arcadis will indemnify you from any third party claims that arise out of BP and Arcadis negligence associated with the activities performed. Mm -hmm. That's fine. So is, is that satisfactory? To the only thing I think, and the only thing I would add, I don't see it in here, is that that indemnity should survive the, um, the termination or completion of the monitoring well. Because if I don't, what I don't want to happen is they, they're done and they say, well, the, the yeah. indemnity stops. No, the yeah. indemnity continues beyond. If claims arise later, we're still protected. So it should survive the earlier expiration or termination of the agreement. That's all. Can you ask somebody to add that, Patrick? Yeah. I mean, that's all. Yeah, I can email you. But yeah, it just survives the early expiration or termination of the agreement. Yeah. You'll so give us some sample later? Sure. Okay. Hold on. Hey, Pat, did you say for a decade they've been watching this particular spot? This area, or I have just been aware of some wells they put in. I say ten years, maybe it's eight. I don't know, but they've been over there for quite a while. In reference to this, right? This same, same area. area. Okay. Right. So we must be downgrading. That's why they're putting right. the well yes, over right. here. They're seeing if it's migrating. Which again, the only good thing we have going for us is nobody in the city uses groundwater. They all have to use city water. That's right. They well, use groundwater. Well, that's John. not totally true, John. Well, there's no wells here. Well, where's the well that people use? The do? water all eventually is on a well, though. I mean, no, but I mean that's the biggest concern I think they're looking at is because if the groundwater and the water table is contaminated, or people drilling like if you're in a township and people are drilling for the drinking water, that would be a bad situation. Yeah, but if it seeps into Champion Creek, well, that's a stream. Stream those who, who I think it's the water. Yeah, that, that's the stream. That's they could well, we all get it. It goes, it goes to Rocky River, the right. Crystal Lake area. Right. right. So that would not be just the whole answer, John. Wouldn't be just wells. If it's or leaking into the creek. Well, it would be filtered by the time it gets to Lake Erie somewhat, but, but there's a lot more. Too, I'd be more concerned about things downtown than going to Lake Erie. I, mean, uh, I, I, I want to ask Frank's question in a, in a little more blunt terms. Why don't they just pull the tank out, Patrick? I believe the tank is out. I don't what, think it's what, still there. there was, what, it was what, leaking what, prior to. Yeah. This was contamination before they removed it. Okay, so. <laughs> Got help me understand this then. If the tank is gone, the source is gone, they didn't clean out the soil, they left the soil there when they took the tank out? Any of the soil that migrated, that I should say soil. It got into the groundwater. Oil migrated from that site. That is what they're looking at. It leached okay. out and got into the groundwater, and the okay, groundwater then okay. dispersed hundreds of yards away. Hey Pat, how many water samples have been taken in the area on Champion Creek in the last 10 years? I don't know that, Mark. All he knows is don't drink out of it. I know, but we walk through it all the time trying to clean it. But, uh. <coughs> Maybe they're checking that too. I'm sure under the uh, Ohio EPA guidelines and a buster, they have to check all that out. That's why they got these wells there I'm, to see what, what level of particulates, they call it, are there. Hopefully not a lot, but it's kind of scary. It's scary that they're putting another well in because that means that they did find enough evidence That's right. that it's moving. Right. <laughs> now, in the long run, is BP responsible for that? Or That's what we were just talking about, yes. Or is Busy B responsible for it? Well, it would be the person who did the installation and removal of the tank, which would have been BP, I believe. They would be the ultimate think. party. But, but, if, but if somebody purchases that property, right. don't they accept that liability? Depends what the purchase agreement provides. That, that doesn't mean the other one is exempt. No, it doesn't mean the other one's exempt either. The cause, the EPA is going to go after the ultimate mm -hmm. perpetrator, let's call it. That did it. Good. This is good stuff. Okay, it's, not, it's not good stuff. Joe. It's good stuff that we're talking about it because the bad thing is if we didn't talk about this, it would just happen without us knowing. That's true. Uh, move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 1771 expenditure over 15000 for uh, Labyrinth Management Group. Yes, thank you. Um, this is just to for finance committee approval only for expenditures mm -hmm. over fifteen thousand between fifteen thousand and twenty five thousand for the uh, um, all the work that we've hired Labyrinth Management Group to do Labyrinth Management Group to do as part of the Planning Commission review of the Osborne project. So uh, the last item put us over that fourteen thousand mark. So I had to go to finance committee. Right, okay. Over the fifteen thousand rather. So. Okay. Move to approve. Second. And Mr. Colzer will have to abstain. I'm abstaining because Osborne is a client of mine. 
employer and even though this is for another company it's still I don't like the looks of it. Appearance of a conflict. Got it. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All against? Aye. No. Oh, I'm sorry. All abstentions? Aye. <laughs> Getting excited. Yeah. Okay. Um, 17172, adopt a TIF ordinance revenue sharing agreement and, for, and TIF parcels. Kimberly. Thank you, Mr. President. As part of our downtown strategic redevelopment planning efforts, the city has been working on creation and implementation of a TIF program. This request is to adopt a TIF ordinance, the TIF parcels, and the revenue sharing agreement with Medina City Schools. The implementation of tax increment financing program will allow the city to capture property taxes on the redeveloped parcels as listed on the TIF parcel map, which is in your packet, to offset the cost of the historic district parking facility, which we received the million dollar grant for. Parking facility is estimated to cost three and a half million. million. We received a million capital bill funding grant from the state of Ohio via the <coughs> legislative request in 2016. The remaining portion of the parking that can be paid for by an internal advance with costs being recouped as a result of the TIF program. The Medina City School Board met on Monday, September 18th and voted to approve the city moving forward with the TIF program and the reason we needed that um, their approval is because we're asking for a 30-year TIF, so it requires school board approval. Um, and we went with the 30-year because that is what the feasibility study revealed that it would take to, that's what it would take to uh, recoup that two and a half million. We are asking for the emergency clause so that we may submit said documents with application to the state of Ohio by mid-October October for their review and approval of the project and the funding. Thank you. Just to clarify what you said, it's not going to take 30 years to recoup the money based upon any future development. It's, the study was based upon it'll take 30 years to recoup the money based upon a development that we know is going to occur today. Correct. Which is the Liberty Street portion and the Chamber Building. Correct. Just with those two projects, it will take 30 years to recoup the two and a half million dollar account. If there's any other development that occurs within these TIF parcels mm -hmm. that are shown here, of course that time period should go down. The way yeah. You said it. yeah, I'm sorry. I probably should have <laughs> spelled it out a little bit more. But yeah, so if anything that happens on the South Liberty project, you know, is kind of what we're calling it internally, would then reduce that time from 30 years to whatever, and that's the goal. Correct. Now, will it be mandatory mandatory on that South Liberty project for anybody that wants to develop in there? Is it mandatory then to join the TIF? That's yeah. The tip okay. is going to be. I think you have a copy of. Oh, yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, just yeah, want to yeah. make sure if it's mandatory. You know. But remember, there's no yeah. nothing changes from a developer because no, the developer is a developer there. The TIF, all the TIF does is say, well, the taxes that you were going to pay anyways now is divided differently. So the developer is not impacted mm -hmm. as far as the the cost of the development or the the real estate taxes that are charged to the improvements on the land. They're just allocated differently once the um, monies go to the auditor. The auditor then doesn't give them all to the school. It gives service payments back to the city to cover the debt that's paid off. And yep. Oh, I'm sorry. No, another question. So let's, and again, this is just, let's say that parking deck is full and there's some major development on the South Liberty, but we don't have adequate parking in the existing deck. Let's say we have to build something else. Now, is that South Liberty TIF, can we? No. Put that the TIF is used for the, the TIF is used for that so purpose. Just be for that deck right there. Yes, if okay. you wanted to do something else, you'd have to do another gotcha. arrangement gotcha. To, to do that. Once the yeah. once the okay. debt or obligation is paid off associated with this, then the TIF will go away because the ordinance is specific yes. to this development. Yeah. And I'd just like to make a comment for it. And I'm sure the public has heard and read some some of us, but the schools graciously accepted uh, the, this offer, which means they're still going to receive their tax dollars for the properties as it sits now. Well, our hopes is that when it's developed that the tax rate for those parcels will increase substantially. The schools have has, has agreed to just maintain the amount of money that initially that they're getting for that plus we will the TIF will reimburse them 50 percent 50 percent so they're not going to get the total 
if the areas become developed, which they, I'm sure they will, uh, the, the, the school's still going to benefit. They're just not going to benefit for 100% a, a of what they would get with the redevelopment for until the... They get 50% 50, 50 of any of the taxes generated in the approved value of the property. Right. And we get 50% of it. If we did nothing, technically they'd get zero, and we would get zero because nothing would happen. Right. So we're trying to share it, so it's a good collaboration. A collaborative but, but they still get 100% of what the value is as of today. As of today. today. And they get 100% once it's paid off right. of the increased value. So they but get benefit from that perspective. We are you know, very gracious to the school for accepting this. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, we think, I mean, they think too, it's a win-win for both of us. Right. Because they get something, we get something, you know, the downtown gets something, so it all, Everybody gets something out of this. Correct. That's a good thing, I guess. Mr. Huber. Mr. Huber. Well, we're York Township, where we give a lot of thought to how we're going to keep our operation going. We sort of regard this sort of analysis as wishful thinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what to say about York Township, but we try to be creative here and try to make things work. Uh, and trying to figure ways to generate additional tech. Hopefully this is not wishful thinking. Hopefully this will develop into reality thinking, I guess. But, but, but our thought process is based in some fact in other areas in the state of Ohio where they've employed this thought and it's worked for them. Well, which I learned that there's over 600 TIFs in Ohio. I didn't know that. That was kind of amazing. So there's, there's some history of, behind our wishful thinking. Yes. We're not, the, we're not the first ones to try it. That's right. Well, we've been approached by no less than four different developers just knowing that we're talking about this to say they have interest in the, the parcel between Sully's and the federal chambers. So it's not like we're hoping somebody's, they're waiting on us. They keep asking right. when's the RFP going to be right. ready. They say, well, I have to get this TIF in place first so right. they come to agree to that part of it. But the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, so Patrick is so fortunate to build us this parking deck. Is he Patrick? Is he brilliant? <laughs> I didn't know he could do that. <laughs> well, you know, I'll put out the bid and everything. Um, with the state, we're able to draw down on those funds. Like, we don't have to wait till the whole thing's built and then get reimbursed. We can draw down those funds as we go, which I think is a nice way of you know, like if we're drawing down our money and, and we're drawing down the state's money, a little bit easier. I think, well, let's be let's be clear because Mark brought this up. We, in the in the 701, the capital improvement or general purpose capital account 301. Uh, is that 301? 301. 301. Um, do we have the cash available or the money available? The cash is it gets complicated about the cash situation because of all the cash is in there. Keith? We don't know the cash. Is, we don't know how much of a balance there is available out of it because it's not all cash. Well, the 301 is. But is it all cash? The cash is there, okay. I thought the general fund with the grants, we borrowed the money. And well, the grants that's for the grant, but the 301 fund has cash in it. Oh, right? and it's $4.2 million, I believe, right around there. That sounds right. I don't have it in front of me, but that sounds right. So we're, we're borrowing or lending or advancing 2.5 of that 4.2 million. So we're still going to have uh, 1.7 million balance in that account. That's a big hit. It is. But the good thing is, what what Mr. Huber said, wishful thinking, is that we're going to pay ourselves back over time. So the money is coming in through the, the service payments from the increase in the real estate taxes will replenish that amount over time. So we're not just taking it out and never putting it back. There'll be money coming back to replenish that over time. And, and we calculated that putting the South Liberty project in here, the demand, the possible future demand from South Liberty on that parking deck. Do we have any, any idea of what numbers those are? And, can that parking deck even meet that demand? We have no clue. Well, Huber has no clue, but we did look at that. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm, I'm worried about locking up that whole block just for a parking deck that I think is almost going to be full. So, Mark, are you saying that we should well, we make the parking deck bigger? No. <laughs> we need more no, money. I well, the goal is that, I think you're exactly right, we hope that deck is full because that means we were successful. Hey, if that deck's oh, not full, or then, then under calculated. Well, I think, you think uh, you're meeting under if, if we undercalculate, I mean, that is that is another good thing. I, I guess the question is, if we continue to have issues with parking downtown, even putting another deck in, that means to me that we were successful because we were bringing so much activity downtown that we still don't have enough parking for all that we're doing. And for a town our size, 
that'll be fantastic because I don't think there's many towns in Ohio that have issues like that. And I hope we have issues like that because that means we're successful. That's my opinion. I mean, oh, that, that sounds Paul great. That sounds great, John. Is Paul resigned? I don't know what happened. Swapped away, I guess. Okay. But um, <laughs> so even takes that no, and your 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 issues are noted. I mean, I, I guess. Well, well, let me share this because I'm here every day. In fact, I walk around picking up trash and whatnot every day. Every day, the parking lot at City Hall and between Sully's and Porter's and across the street is so full that between noon and one, you see cars just sure. traveling around that eventually leave and go somewhere else. Uh, or at least they park somewhere where, where we can't see them and if they, if they do come back in. But, but my sense is that they probably get frustrated that the parking is not there and end up going either to the north side or up to 18 and 71 or, or somewhere else. So the need is there now and then the development is going to expand the need. There's, there's no doubt. I, I, I kid you not, I walk through that parking lot Probably. and it, it, every single spot is full and then they go across the street when they can get a break in traffic and as far as you can see, those spots are full. And then, you know, where do they go next? Well, and I appreciate that, Mayor. I know you're hands-on around the community, but I mean, we have an open area that could have been surface lot by now that could have been used and utilized for additional parking. But we didn't want to put money in it to tear it back out a year or two. No, later. no, I get that. It's just different visions and philosophies. I just want to add to you know I work for a employer that used to be on the square, and probably 20 years ago I sat on a committee that examined uptown parking, and we determined 20 years ago there wasn't enough parking. And then I think about how much has happened with the square and how vibrant it is, much more than it was 20 years ago. It took us 15 years to get one deck. Right. But this has been an ongoing issue for years, long before we even got to this point where there's really exciting things going on on the square and yeah. demand beyond belief. But well, I'm excited 20, 25 years from now what it's going to look like, meaning the activity that's going to be maintained because the death of the city is the death of its <coughs> major this, hub. This downtown. city's not going to die. Well, we it, 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 was on, it was on a path. Make... It was on a path of 10, 15 years ago, which could have gone either way. There could have been more activity put down in the square. There could have been no Main Street Medina. There could have been no, what we've done as a council. The courts could have moved. The courts could have moved. The courts could have moved. We had a lot of things happen. I was happen. there with you guys trying to keep them here. Right, so. yeah, I know. There's a lot of things I, that I, I would have to say that, that that was the beginning of the revitalization. Not, I mean, not, I'm not talking back in the 60s when the revitalization of the buildings itself, the structures, took place. But the, the court threatening to leave the square and not have their footprint as it is today, that really started the administration and council. Again, I think you know you were around then. It was it was hard to vote, even though we were having cooperation from the county and, and the library. It was it was hard to vote to spend that money for that parking deck. And yes, during the nights when there's no events going on, there's empty spaces in there. You know, it's almost empty. But, uh, it's made up for when during the day and, and when there's events going on because it's. But I, I honestly think that that really, is, you know, like you said, Jim, 20 years ago you started talking about parking on the on the square and surrounding areas. So I well, still feel in my heart this is the the right move. Well, and I think about Bill. Let's go back to when the bank decided to stay on the square. That was they oh, took fans. a chance. Yep. Yeah when Washington Properties decided to redevelop right. Ziegler's. When the town could have folded up. Sure. Yeah. Those right. are exactly. all times that were key points in the development of that square and keeping it alive and vibrant. And people made big gambles on it mm. that paid off. I guess what I, that's what I look on that we're doing again. Well, I think First we're Merit, on first Merit was the biggest gamble because First Merit had, a, had the plans to do- Old Phoenix. Old Phoenix, rather, had the plans to build a new building outside of town and township. And they were convinced in the 60s because they were local, basically local folks that ran the bank, owned the bank, that they would do that major restoration of the downtown bank and they scrapped the plans to build the new bank. It's like Jimmy said, or Councilman Shields said, huh? if you look at it, Mark, it's like an evolution of just at the right time and 
these certain things happen, you know, over over <coughs> 60 years you know, in time. And if they, but if they hadn't happened, any one of those times that you know right. that could have been the, the lynch that or the link that broke. And when you bring up the fact of uh, Old Phoenix discussing building off the square, what was the main reason for doing that? I remember. Yeah. Well, there was no. no there was no parking. There was no place and they, to not, they weren't as. I mean, they were concerned for their employees. Don't get me wrong, because all floors were filled at that time. But their main concern is there's other banks not only on the square but coming to the square, changing branches, that you know there, there's not enough parking. So if we want to maintain our customers and grow our customers, we ought to consider moving off the square. Thank God they did. Right. Well, the exciting thing is, though, now now banks are almost, a, 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 you know, obsolete. You know, right. the buildings themselves have become almost obsolete. But the city has has progressed in a way that was smart enough that we that all these changes were accommodated. That it's a thriving community, even though, right. you know, if you look around, I think it was five or six. I think I made mention of it here one time. Five or six banks once on the square. You know, one bank on the one bank on the square now, but. The, the, the square area the community is no worse off for it because right. it's just as exciting now because in those places that were banks you can go eat you can go shop so there was that great evolution over that period of time that that brought us to where we are but at any one time and you made a good point Jim about the about Ziegler's when Ziegler's closed up and and Mike Rose stepped in had he not stepped in that probably would have be, become some sort of a, a secondhand store divided up into stalls and who knows what would have happened but there was that serious investment that actually actually stopped that from happening uh, it's an interesting it's an interesting little history uh -huh. i'll add the library into it too they were going to move off the square and thankfully they stayed there they were to go to the township as well right mr huber i think the critical issue in talking to other water directors in this analysis is going to be your developer and the TIF. The, the leap here that's going to be made will be choosing the right developer who can make this profitable because if it doesn't, if it's a wrong developer, uh, some of these TIFs just don't work out and that's going to be where the rubber's going to hit the road. You're going to have there's going to have to be care taken. It's not surprising to me that a number of different developers are interested in this because there's been a lot of infrastructure provided for a developer to try to make some money. The critical issue is whether this person can make his plan profitable. And that's where the tip becomes uh, an issue. It, it can work or it cannot work. And really from talking to a number, including the law director out in Kent, uh, that's where you're going to have to make your best call. Well, with your assistance, I think we talked about we would like to ground lease that parcel in the front so we have more control of it. If right. it does fail, we can take it back quickly and turn it around to another developer. So we have a little bit more control, and that's the beauty of owning land, that we can do things like that. So you're on it, Mr. Hoover. We like that. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, I have one other comment, just because it involves the schools here, my employer, I'm going to need to abstain to avoid any parents of the <coughs> Okay. So, Tim, you going to make a motion then? Correct. Move to approve. So we need to have emergency clause in this? Yes, please. Uh, and and uh, move to approve with the emergency clause. Second, including the emergency clause. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Uh, oh, any abstentions? Aye. Sorry about that. I must have forgot you. Uh, 17173 adopt 2017 Ohio Building Code section 1335. Mr. Gladish. November of this year, the state of Ohio Board of Building Standards will be adopting a more current version of the building and building related codes, being that we're a state of Ohio certified building department. We're required to adopt and enforce the, the codes of the state of Ohio. So this, this, this adoption, we, we are currently under the 2011 uh, building codes, we're going to jump to the 2017. Typically, the code, the city, the state does it in a three year cycle. They're skipping a cycle and jumping up six years. Uh, this is a good thing because of the ISO ratings of the building departments across the state of Ohio. Being that we're using an older code, it affects our ratings, all the building departments across the state. How does this affect your operations as a building code and the inspectors? And uh, nothing, it's just, I mean, we'll have some dollar cost to update our building codes. The, the changes are minimal. You know, 
that's not going to be a major impact to that. So the ISO is related to the insurance yeah, ratings the insurance and insurance coverage and the premiums that the residents will pay based upon what the city does as far as their inspection criteria based upon adoption of the code. And, and earlier this year in March, we were uh, rated by the uh, ISO office, and all the building departments have got, it, got it, a, a worse rating because of the codes that the state of Ohio adopts. So this is going to help us out. We did get an extension on our rating from March till mid-November. So once we adopt this, then we should be back to our at least equal to or better than our last rating of three or five years ago. Questions? Mr. Gladish, um, do we have any training requirements for the for you and your yeah. staff? Yes, and we've uh, we've attended a few. There are mandated training classes to upgrade uh, some of the changes. So uh, we we've, we've attended uh, one or there's a few more that are coming up here about before the end of the year. Thank you. The classes are free. There's no cost. Of, you know, it's the city's. I mean, our labor is. Okay. Thank you. And this is this is. There's seven codes that we enforce uh, through the state of Ohio. This is just the two of them. They're going to be amending or uh, adopting some, other, some of the other codes, the energy code, the uh, residential code of Ohio, the mechanical code. Thank you. Any other questions? Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. And the next one, yeah, this is the adoption of the 2017 uh, plumbing code, section 1345, related to the same thing. And Mr. Glass just explain. Questions? Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Uh, 1775, uh, net profit tax grant incentive for local businesses. Um, I guess I submitted this one um, because yes. <laughs> I guess I was guessing I did. Uh, if you recall, the state of Ohio passed the law whereby the net profit tax of every business should be paid to the state of Ohio. The state of Ohio will process those returns and then send us the money that we collect through the city of Medina. Less a fee. Less a fee associated with them processing it. So I thought maybe we should be a little bit active and progressive in this regard and try to think of a way because we cannot change our income tax code uh, and treat anybody different than anybody else with respect to the allocation and collection of those income taxes. But we can develop a grant program that provides a business a grant uh, if they do pay their net profit tax directly to the city, they could get a grant that may be equal to the amount of money that we would lose if we paid the state of Ohio that fee, whereby we could give that grant to the business so they directly benefit from that and maybe encourage them to pay their taxes to us rather than the state of Ohio. And keep the money in the city. What additional costs to the city? If we're doing that? I don't know if there would be really any additional costs except for the grant and determining. Well, besides that, just us. We, are, we already collect them, I guess, right now. Right. Well, no we're currently, we're collecting. No additional costs. I mean, that sounds like a good idea. I'm just trying to figure out. CCA and switching to Rita charges a small fee for collections, but it's not. Okay. Now, is there, would there be at some point in time that the state could mandate us to do that? They could. I mean, a lot of us have felt all along that the ultimate goal of the state here is to take over collection of the income tax. And if they do that, yes, right. they can mandate it not just the business entirely. Right, right. right. This and is a step in that direction, and we're trying to abate it. The, and this one at this time is, is set up as, as at the option of the taxpayer. So, you know, they could, the next step could be, okay, all net profits have to be paid to the state. At that point, if we had a grant program, I think we'd want to make sure that we wrote it such that if that happens, the grant ends. Right. It, it, I mean, I guess it would, I don't know, it might be a moot point because the grant would be if you pay to the city, but if they're no longer able to pay to the city, well, they don't get the grant anymore. Well, and the reason for this, Keith brought this up when he, I think you checked this out, when he checked each of us out with they're, the state of Ohio. They're so far off. Uh, this was a while ago. I checked the uh, the nine of us, the, the seven council members, the mayor and myself, and of the nine of us, I think they had four of us listed as not living in the city of Manette. Right. All, so, all nine of us do but the state of Ohio was wrong on that many. And that's how they allocate the income tax. They, they operate this site, it's called The Finder. And I get calls, you know, certainly during tax season, I get three calls a week from people that, well, I checked on The Finder and it said I didn't live in the city, so I didn't file taxes, and now I'm getting charged a fee. Well, you know, that's the state. They, so the business wouldn't incur any additional difficulties in process and the profit tax, right? No, I think the only thing the business would do and what we try to do is create an incentive for the business to do is pay us and not the state. Because 
they're well, they're going to be getting flyers from the state to say pay us the income net income net profit tax and here you go we're making it easy for you and our goal would be to say you know what we're going to make it easier for you pay us and we'll give you a grant back so you can live a little more money in your pocket because we do not as a city want the money going to the state no i'd like right. to see <laughs> no and i hear you i agree with you fully i'd like to and by what you're on paper what you're looking at by us we mean so why was, i want you guys to help i mean i just can't i don't know really what we want to see i thought it would be a grant because i know we can't change our income tax but if there's a way we could make the grant equal the value of the money that we would lose but pay that directly to the um business. the business right. that would be we would be net the same mm -hmm. but the business would be net ahead and their goal would be to say the business we're looking out for you we want to put more money in your pocket and if they're ahead then they're going to want to pay it to us they're going to want to pay it to well, us so and they they would be paying it to rita correct correct so our agreement with cca and the agreement with rita both state that they are the sole so i mean i would and i i i agree with your idea 100 percent. it it seems like it, before we even start this we're going to be able to formulate what the state's going to charge i mean they're going to charge a percentage so couldn't we work it out with rita for for businesses if the business if we notify the business you're going to pay it directly to rita or to the city the rita can deduct whatever that percentage is no i don't think you can change income tax that's it that's the problem. We have to collect it, but then we'll have to pay it back to oh, the grant. Okay, never mind. I think we can't <laughs> we can't treat anybody differently in income tax collection. Keith, we know what the percentage is, though, right? Is it a half percent now? Was one, and they reduced it to a half. That I'm sorry, they redistributing us? No, the state to give us our money back. Oh, I, I don't. I think it was stated in there. It was, but I thought it was one percent at first, and then when everybody raised cane about it, uh, including the chamber, I thought they dropped it to a half a percent. That's what I remember. But, but, but to, to Denny's point, we know what that is. Right. So then the grant to figure, you know, is is easy instead of giving. And, and I think we want to make it effective as of January first, because that's when it starts, right? January first of eighteen. So we'd want to. We have a few months here to, right. to work on it, but because the city would still be whole. Right, right, right. Because instead of the state keeping a half percent, our local companies keep the half percent and can do something right. more with it. So right. why, why would we not want to? Yeah, so it's not really going to cost us anything. Exactly. It's already going to cost us. <laughs> it would be a good well, gesture for the business. The, the other thing that causes me great concern, and Keith and I have talked about sure. this, is anytime the state takes anything, yeah. and you yeah. want to know, okay, well, how much did this company give you? They don't want to share anything with you. Right. This, this is your percentage back. You have no idea what the company sent. I, I've talked about this with the public utility tax that they collect. That they, that's mandated. We don't have any choice about it. They occasionally send us a thing where we're required to pay a refund, and the refund will be thirty percent of what they paid us for the previous year, not that entity, the total that the state <laughs> paid us. And they tell us you have to pay this. We have no choice in the matter, and they don't give us the backup documentation to it. I've talked to other finance directors about it. we don't have any documentation from the state. We just get a check. This is your amount. I can't audit that. I can't look and say, you know, did this company pay did that? It's just, this is what we get. And then if they gave us too much, they tell us we have to pay a refund and we get like 30 days to pay it. And if we don't, we're paying fees on that. I mean, there's no, there's no way to fight it. You have to do it. I don't know if they're doing it right. Well, I don't have any way to check. Well, I wouldn't imagine we'd be the only city trying to do this. Cause I, I mean, we're a smaller city, but I would imagine the city of Cleveland and those cities would probably try to think of something like this yeah. to try to keep their money okay. to them. So the only thing that I think will be difficult about it is it's not going to be a it's going to be a very small amount of money because the net profits tax that a, that a company pays right. generally is a pretty small amount of money out of our total collections it's less than about 10 percent of the income tax that we collect then you divide that out over all the different but it's still about a million tax. dollars it right but it's <laughs> over all of the employers in the city right. and, you're, and you're talking about one percent of that to each one it's not going to be which is good in the sense that I mean the appropriation for this grant is not going to be a lot I just don't know for each individual entity. Well, the most entities probably things. wouldn't change, but the entities that would want to change that the state's trying to get changed is those larger corporations that are located in multiple cities. Mm -hmm. And we're going to try to keep them. We might lose some of them, but if we could keep a few of them, I think that would be beneficial to us. And, you know, who knows? I mean, but I think if a lot of cities did this, the state will change it and make it a mandate, which would be disappointing because we have no way to audit it. And we'd lose more money. We only lost what a million a year right now. Sorry, right. the, we keep losing money. People are going to wonder why the taxes have to go up because the state taking it all, and we have no choice. So, but they balance your budget <laughs> <laughs> off of the municipalities' bands. Yeah, the schools. They do. the schools. So we don't. We don't want that to continue, and we're disappointed that I think our legislators supported it. 
which is not what we want, but they did. Exactly. So I was kind of disappointed. So we're going to try to find ways around it. So you, hopefully, if we're creative enough, we could circumvent the people who vote for us. <laughs> because it doesn't really, meaning our legislators who right, voted okay, for the, yeah, the passage of this net profit tax, <coughs> keeping it. I mean, we, it wasn't really a benefit to the city. Right. So. <laughs> All right, well, we'll put something together and bring it back. But I just want to see if everybody's kind of okay with that idea. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Um, the uh, 17176 discuss tree issues. City sidewalk program. This Patrick. Thank you. Uh, this is both Jason and I both. We're getting ready to start our city sidewalk program. The deadline for folks to get their uh, repair the sidewalk on their own is passed just last week. Um, Jansen and Curtis went out <coughs> and looked at a number of areas where uh, suspected that the city street tree was causing the damage to the sidewalk. You might remember when well, that's the case, the city pays for the repair of the sidewalk. Jensen came back to me and said there is a number of trees that for us to put back, repair the sidewalk per our existing specification, uh, would either the tree would either have to be removed or the damage we would do to the root system would be enough that it would lead to problems with the tree where it might be a liability if it fell. A couple, a couple cases, the tree, I think he said the trees needed to come out and they were in bad shape already. But <coughs> The couple, we went out and looked at a few and I attached them there. They beautiful trees that would need to come out or be removed or we would damage them for no other reason than to repair about eight foot of sidewalk. And we didn't think that was a good idea. So I think we're coming here to ask for your blessing, so to speak, to allow us on an individual basis to make our best decision. We can, uh, in some cases, we can alter our spec I usually we go four inches of side, concrete sidewalk and two inches of base. Maybe we don't put the base in that particular tree, we can get it in and not damage the roots. Now, we're susceptible in that case, obviously, you know, 10 years from now or something, we, we may be in the same position after have to replace the sidewalk again, that's part of it. In a couple of cases, we might be able to go around the trees, so the sidewalk wouldn't be straight down the street, it might bubble out. But I guess, guess your thoughts and our recommendation you would allow us to kind of use our best judgment to alter our specs at certain points to avoid having to tear out these trees. Thoughts? I'd like to see us, um, I, I, I looked at these uh, trees and I talked to Pat, Pat about them and um, in, in, we have two priorities. One is we want to have the sidewalks repaired so it's walkable and the second one is we have a, we have a tree program okay. so we want to have healthy trees. And if you look at the, to the total number, it's really pretty small. Sure. But, if, but the three options that they listed that they could do that would accommodate both the sidewalk and the tree look to me like a flexibility that's that's worthwhile you know accepting that flexibility so that they can use their own judgment of whether or not you can um, you can not go as deep on the route or you can you can work with the property owner and maybe just adjust where the sidewalk goes um, or for the time being you can address the sidewalk depending on the um, how serious the issue is address the sidewalk as is to make it so that it meets the, the state gotcha. state standards because we don't we don't want to be in the in the I don't we don't want to be in the business of Just removing tree. trees that are healthy and big and and, and 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 beneficial to the to that resident in the neighborhood but on the other hand we do want to we do want to um, carry on with the sidewalk program so that that kind of flexibility to me seems really pretty reasonable because you know, between Jensen and Patrick, they're they're taking a look at this. They can see what's the best option to pursue. Talk to the red property owner, and then and then just get it done. I agree. Jensen, what kind of feedback are you getting from residents that if we do the option of curvature of coming out of out a little ways, is a lot of times it's in the property owner's um, property and out of our right of way, or is there a lot of these? areas uh, we still have a little room to bend out further or is it these sidewalks are right on the property line yeah we've only it's done same. that a, a couple a handful of times uh, one was on north Elmwood five or six years ago and the other one is over on Wadsworth Road um, that we're about to uh, go through right now but um, most of the time well the location of these trees is pretty much in the historic district um, and the reason we have the problem is because the trees weren't planted in the center of the tree line. Um, a lot of them have overhead utilities. So it's really every, 
every tree conflict is situational. Um, and when you approach a resident, you know, we, it's kind of 50 50 as to whether or not they care about the tree. Um, we prefer to keep the, the sidewalk straight uh, for obvious reasons, um, but these situations are unusual and we have to uh, address each one of them um, differently. So I guess long story short, um, as long as they have, you know, if they want the trees to be there, they're okay. Most, most people will be reasonable and want whatever's best for the tree. But then, you, you know, on the other hand, you've got people that really can care less. Um, so it's all, I guess there's not a clear answer for that. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm one of the residents he's talking about. Uh, I discussed this situation with him. I have no problem curving the sidewalk around the tree. As I walk my dogs, I've seen other developments <coughs> have curves around the trees. The tree in my front yard is beautiful. It's healthy. I can't see cutting it down. When I got that letter to say, you have to do something, remove the tree by such and such a date, I'm going, no, I don't want to do that. I want to keep the trees. I've seen too many trees cut down because they were the ash tree. I had two in my backyard. My backyard was beautiful, but I had to cut them down because of the board. Now, is your tree in the tree lawn or is it on your lawn? Mine is actually on my lawn. Okay, and it, that's part of the reason I bought the house. Nice tree in the front yard. The root system, I measured it you know, a few days ago. It's like four inches from the sidewalk. But where the sidewalk collapsed is where they did re-piping of the gas line. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I understand the conflicts, pros and cons about it, but I really want to save the trees and save my trees. So I would ask for you to, to give them the option to look at them and decide what to do. I even went as far as gave them permission. They wanted 19 feet that they had marked incorrectly as far as tree damage from the tree lawn. They came back and told me I'd have to pay for that. I said, fine. But when they told me I'm going to have to take the tree down, but I was willing to pay the other 34 feet to make the sidewalk look all nice and uniform in front of the houses, that just, you know, put me in a bad frame of mind as far as trying to save the trees and go along with this program. Well, Pat and Jan, are we talking about, uh, you're talking about not only trees and tree lawns that we're responsible for, but you're also talking about at trees and the residence lawn that you may have to modify the sidewalk There's too. only a couple. What's your address, sir? 329 Howard Street. So you're doing both ways, because the way you presented it originally was the trees were our problem in the tree lawns, but there is also, as he mentioned. There's 24, I think that were private trees. Yeah. And you're looking at like his situation you don't want to cut down a giant tree right you, you work with them to move the sidewalk over maybe because it would go the other way it would yeah. go towards the street but right, there's right. there's distances away from the street that you want to comply with too and all this other stuff so yeah so uh, the issue he's talking about i am familiar with it now that i know what address it is um there was some communication between the engineering department and the forestry department that uh, i was unaware of there um but we are we're looking at every site that has potential tree damage. So um, the uh, issue he brings up, uh, he does have a very large tree uh, in close proximity to the sidewalk, and we were looking at it from a liability standpoint that if the sidewalk is removed and put in per specs, the tree is going to be a considerable, um, it, there's a very good chance that it could fail because of its proximity to the sidewalk. So. Um, I'm not sure what that letter uh, stated, but we, we are going to have to look at some of these private um, tree conflicts as well and have to figure out how to address them because removal might not be the answer and obviously we can understand the frustrations that that um, could put on residents. And I, I think we definitely need to give them as much leniency, leniency as possible. The 24 number that you reference that's just in the the block of the 2017 replacement program or the sidewalk replacement program. that excludes our forestry numbers okay we have because i know well. bill you said there's a small number but i know over in ward three there's a lot of situations where there's a tree there currently that's caused a lift or there was a tree in the past that was there that caused a lift that we came and took out 
but I think it's still our responsibility to correct. So there's I probably mean, just as many or more. The tree. What's that? If we remove a street tree and it, because of the sidewalk issue, we immediately the forest department removes the sidewalk and makes it passable. Well, what happens if you remove the tree prior to us doing the sidewalk program? We still, if the sidewalk is messed up because of the street tree, we fi we fix it. Oh, well, that's what we should do. And that's, that's what, what we, we don't that's what we have any, it is I mean, no, that's what's in the ordinance right okay yeah well, the ordinance I mean, is that if this tree caused the the sidewalk the city pays for the sidewalk right sure but i didn't mean that it was a small number citywide because i don't i don't really know but i meant that the, what we're looking at the on an annual basis would appear to be a fairly limited number compared to the number that exists in in town and they will mostly be in the inner city so it it, it looks like like this gentleman was talking about, I mean, a really reasonable kind of flexibility to give to the two people that are responsible for the program to make it right for us, what we want, and to make it right for the president. Because we want to do everything we can. I mean, we're at Tracy USA for what, 34 years, 35 now? Thirty-five. We want to save our big trees. Sure. We want to save our old trees. So if we give them more flexibility to, to do that, I think. Uh, so what do you guys need? What do they need from us to give you more flexibility? I think this is just an FYI. I don't know that we. So you really don't need it. <laughs> no, I'd just like to say that I, I thank you for taking it upon yourselves to to come up with some solutions for this problem. I'm sure there's other engineers and and uh, parks directors that uh, probably would say this is what the ordinance says. This is what we're doing. So thank you uh, for gentlemen like this. And there are some instances where. No matter what solution you come up with, it's it's not necessarily right. going to work. So we might have to cut a few. At least you're doing the best you can. We have to rule out everything else right. before we get to that point. Thank you. I have one concern. Um, I, I agree that we need to give them some flexibility, um, but if we're going to do that, uh, we have a resident right now that Mr. Uber and Mr. Patton are familiar with, where we're asking her to change her sidewalk back so it's straight and I don't think it's going to look right if we're going to give up the flexibility to have sidewalks curve if we don't give up on forcing her to change hers. Do you guys agree? I thought that we decided that issue already. Did we? Yeah. Yeah, we decided to keep it the way it was. <coughs> okay. Well, right, but he's saying... Something down the road. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I no, that, I, that, I didn't realize we gave up on that. Right. Yeah. Maybe I wasn't here for I that. Think you, no, I, I think, think you weren't here. Okay. Yeah, otherwise, you're right. We would, okay. otherwise, you're right. We couldn't. Yeah. Okay. Never mind. Okay. All right, guys. Well, uh, anybody uh, council? Uh, uh, I do have a concern with all this. Uh, uh, going back in, in history of things that happened in the city back in the late 80s, early 90s, when they were building a shopping plaza and there was a tree in the way. Right. And um, <laughs> they built around that tree and the tree died anyway. Okay? I don't know, somebody was hugging it or something. <laughs> <laughs> both fingers, Bill, both fingers. fingers. <laughs> okay? But the tree died anyway. All right? Are, are we hurting the tree by doing the, this mitigation or by you know, moving the sidewalk or put let the sidewalk? I can see maybe going around it might help it. But if we go right back over those roots again, are we, are we doing the tree a harm or are we doing it good? Any construction in the critical root zone is going to be harm, harmful to the tree. Right. But it, it, in order for, as long as the trees are healthy, they're still providing a benefit to us. So you, you got to kind of quantify. But I guess in that regard, if it's a private tree, I guess I'm confused with your with this whole shopping thing. Because if I'm a private owner and I have a tree on my private property, I can cut it down no matter what anybody says. You have no obligation to keep any trees on your property. You, if I want to, you're right. You're if right. I want to clear cut my property, but no, nobody else can tell you to keep a tree on your property. You want that? <laughs> they can. They, they did this in Copley where this, they developed. Well, they did the, the that in Medina. Well, the residents wanted to keep this nice tree area where this guy wanted to develop, and so they voted it down. So the next day, he cut them all down. <coughs> cut every one of them down because they wanted to keep them, and they stopped his development. So he took his right of a private property and cut them all down. So I guess I'm a little confused when if you don't if you want to cut a tree down, just go with the saw and cut it down. I guess to answer your question, Paul, any any excavation you do is going to be harmful to the tree. That's not our concern. Our concern is these trees are two to three inches away from the sidewalk, and we're going to be bringing a, a grinder in and eliminating the buttress roots, 
which are the anchoring roots for the tree. That's what yeah. our concern right now is liability. Mm -hmm. We know the tree, if, if, if we, we do, do excavating, is going to. It would fall yeah. over. Yeah. We okay. yeah. We're worried about complete failure, not the health of the right. tree. Mm -hmm. more. Okay. Even though right. it is important. But in order to have the sidewalk installed. Well, I think everybody has agreement that they give you the flexibility to make a judgment call without increasing the liability to the city. Right. Very good. Without that increasing the liability, yeah. Is that a record? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. Uh, 17177, established mandatory repairing range for the police and fire personnel. I think Mr. Huber. I asked Kathy to put this on the agenda <coughs> mainly because the city will be selecting a fire uh, police chief soon and if we are going to establish a retirement age we should start that process quickly put it in place uh, my recommendation would be before the fire chief is selected so that anybody coming anybody coming on as a chief understands that uh, there will be a mandatory retirement age uh, in talking with other law directors, the recommendation with respect to these issues is that the retirement age apply across the board for both the fire chief and any other police officer, primarily because the other job descriptions involved as fire, firemen and police officers involve actually more physical rigorous demands than the fire chief or the police chief himself. And this uh, issue is becoming more and more of an issue because the federal age discrimination laws make it difficult for an employer to deal with a civil service protected fireman or policeman where you're observing physical degradation and changes and at the same time you really don't quite have enough information or uh, ability to draw a line and say you need to stop working the uh, Mandatory retirement age is the methodology that the federal government uses for some of the more physically demanding jobs. Um, 65 years old seems to be a fairly reasonable standard accepted in other jobs, especially at the federal level. But I don't know exactly how the council feels about it. Uh, my recommendation would be in light of some of our experiences that we adopt a mandatory retirement age for these two areas of work that are quite physically demanding. My recommendation would be 65 years old, but as a, uh, I, I think in discussion with Mayor Hanwell, uh, we thought we should bring it to the table for you to consider. Question? So, well, well just make, for clarification first, we're under a time constraint with the police chief because once that list is certified, I have to make an appointment within 30 days. Um, so we changed what Mr. Uh, our intent is to do it for everybody in the police, everybody in the fire, sworn. Um, but we're obligated uh, with our collective bargaining agreements to sit to, to notify the union, which John Delino did today, of our intention to pursue this. Um, we believe it's a, it's management right. They were told we believe it's management right. But if they want to sit down with us. We have to do this back and forth for a while. While we're doing that, I'm running out of my time to do the police chief. So that's why we redid it just for the police and fire chief now. And our intent, and John Delino told us this makes more sense. He, he thinks we would be at greater risk to do it only for the chiefs and not for the rest of the folks because more of the physical and demanding labor is is with the rank and file than it is in the chief's office. Um, so he's, he felt we were on a much better legal standing to do it across the board, but understood the necessity to do this first and then come back and bring bring the rest along. So just in the, in, in the interest of full disclosure, that's that's our plan. We don't want you to think we rethought about it. And well, why couldn't we do it all at once now? What's, uh, what's holding us up if you want to do well, it all at once? Because we can't do that without meeting with the union, giving them a chance to, to weigh in um, but I thought it would be a council decision. It wouldn't it be a policy of the city or would it be a management decision? Well, it, it is a management decision, but because it's not currently in the collective bargaining agreements and you're changing the terms and conditions of employment, we have a duty to, to reach out to them and, and give them a chance to... So why do you need us to do the chiefs? 
Pardon me? Why do you need us to do the well, chiefs? Well, be, because the chief is not part of the union, um, and uh, we want to have it in place before the, the chief is appointed. I guess my only concern would be, I think everybody's different in their age. I mean, at 65, I sure hope I still have, I could do stuff like that. Maybe some officers can. I guess I I'm not too sure why we need a mandatory retirement age. You have discretion. I know that we tried, or at least I tried to make the chief's position not a civil service protective position. So if you felt they couldn't do their job, no matter what, you could fire them. And you could have that right now with the fire chief. So if you don't feel the fire chief is adequate, he's not civil service protected, you could fire the, the fire That's chief. Not true. The, the fire chief is not civil service He's protected. civil service protected. Uh, is he civil service protected? Yeah, and so are the firemen. Right. Well, I guess the chiefs, I guess that's where we get to, because Pat's the only one that's civil service protected, I guess, in a... Uh, with the department. With the department head, right. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you look at, statistically, from health problems, and I think this is why a lot of places have went to mandatory retirement. In fact, I think when you're talking federal, I think the aviation for air traffic controllers is 55. Well, uh, pilots at 65, you have to retire at 65. Right, but I think the air traffic controller, anyhow, there's there's a lot of departments that, whether you're police or firefighter, 65 is the retirement age. And it's not because they, they don't want old people walking around doing, you know, like you said, it might be a 65 year old that has a body of a 45 year old, but statistically, that's when they really start running into major health problems, heart problems, blood pressure problems. Uh, and if it's a physically demanding job, I think you're pr protecting the entities and the individuals by having a retirement. And then, then you're, you know, I, I, it's better to have them retired than. Well, the question is, I guess that's the next question would be, is 65 too old? Maybe you want 60. I was thinking the same way. Is, is 65 too old in, in the, that case, especially in the, the lower ranks where there's the job is more physically demanding. Um, well, on that issue, I, you know, we start to get into gray area because you're straying away from the norm. The norm is 65. Right. Uh, I would rather, and I'm recommending to you, you stay within the norm, but ultimately that this is your decision. John has a good point. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to change anything if you decide and you don't want to. Well, I guess the question is, if we don't change anything, isn't there physical fitness tests that they have to pass? No, no, That's what I'm getting. When I first uh, read this, I they did away with that. Well, couldn't we make it a requirement? Uh, we're negotiating with the union to put it back in. And well, how can much, we do that? How much do you want to pay them to, to pass work? the physical fitness test and all the things that go along when you when you take away Did something and want to add it back in that was in place? Well, I guess when I have a job, i got to pay for my own... CLE, I guess if, you're, if that's part of your job, you have to pay for your own fitness. Okay, so let, let me... Wait, wait, is, are let you me, saying there's no physical requirements right now for chiefs? I'm saying that they're not doing physical testing in the police department right now at all. Okay, it was done away with. So now we're trying to re-implement it, and that's caused us to have to come back to the table because it was done away with and negotiate with the union and, and all the things that go along with that. The, about, re the reason... I'm sorry. I was going to say, how about fire department? Do they have a the fire department? fire department is doing an annual fitness exam, right? And, and our department was uh, until I left, and then, then at some point it was done away with. But the idea of this is that 65 is the far side cutoff. The the other thing that 65 is is we have a minimum or a maximum that people can apply for a police officer job of 35. So you have to have at least 25 years, which is 60 to get your full pension. But if you're off for a substantial period of time, let's say FMLA, let's say um, discipline, they, none of that time counts. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so cutting it right to 60 would be, would be right on the edge. Whereas the 65, even if you had somebody that had 25 years in and they entered the drop and did four or five years in drop, you know that, that you know that would still work out for them. Um, so that so that's kind of the reasoning that Greg and I, you know, looked at as well as his research of what what other um, safety sensitive positions in in other areas. And, and Mayor, don't you find that through your your history with the police department and um, the chief painter here, no, and I think firefighters as well. Very few of them stay on the apartment until they're 65. Correct. Uh, you know, most 
I mean, whether it be police or fire, even even uh, other municipal employees, if they once they reach a retirement age, it's very few years past that 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 they stay active full time. And then police and fire, I think, because of the demands, physical demands, I've. I don't think there's. I mean, we we had a situation that that I think this is is legitimate concerns that we should adopt this 65 and out. Uh, but what is I, Social Security now? Is it 67 and a half? It depends, depends on your birth. Your date of birth. We don't get Social Security. Right. Right. Well, I know, but I'm just talking about what the general public. <laughs> what is the general public? Well, 65 or 67. Right. And then after 67, it's like 67 and three months. Things like that, yeah. But up until, I mean, if you were born before 1953 or 52, it was 65. 65 was the, the full. Reason. Well, they're doing it for different reasons. I mean, they're doing right. it for they're saving money. Yeah, they're Gregor, Gregor, Mayor, let me ask you this. If, if council picks an age here, the civil service, because these are civil service protection, protected jobs, do they need to, civil service commission still need to agree with that? No, I think the council can set the mandatory retirement age. Does civil service look at these ages and have any recommendations? No. No. Do they have to? Because it's an ordinance. If, if council passes an ordinance, then it's not in the civil service rules or anything. Okay. So. But I guess w w my thing is the civil service had to look at whether or not you wanted to keep somebody civil service. It's not up to council to make that determination without the recommendation from the Civil Service Commission. But that's because we were right, taking it away. A, that is in civil service rules. Okay. I mean, I don't know, I guess, I, I mean, this is something new. I mean, we've never had it before um, in the history of the city, right? Because we're doing it now. So is a TIF, John. Right. <laughs> and it only took six months for the tip, so we got so the Christmas lights. Two more months. <laughs> it's all I mean, I don't know, I guess, I, I mean, when do we have to vote by, did you say? I was hoping that if we could get it through finance tonight that we could pass it with the emergency clause October 10th. I don't know if I'm ready for that. Are you guys ready for that? I yes. am. I, I think, it, I think right. it sets a standard that, that you can look forward and you know when you're in the department then or you are the chief, you can, you can for one thing, regardless of other issues that a lot of this is related to, as an individual, you can look you can look forward and you can plan ahead because you know, okay, this, this is, is 60, 65, when I'm 65, I, I know that this is, you know, this is when I'm going to retire from this position. And I, and I think when you look at the issues we have had, it really, it does help deal with those. And it, and it doesn't make it something that you have to contend with over, can I get the physical done or can I get somebody to do something? It's a cutoff day. And everybody knows it ahead of time. And it, to me, that's a pretty legitimate and reasonable. And 65 is, is pretty much, it is a standard cutoff date. I'm 65. Uh, I do have a question. We're not proposing Mr. Council, are we? <laughs> 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 I, I, I have a question with regard to the policeman's pension. Yes, sir. Is, there, is it based strictly on the number of years of service, or does it include an age? The way we all do it now. Should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's a minimum I'm age. I'm not ready. Okay. And, and then uh, a number of years. Okay, what? Well, yes. So I, I think the minimum age is like 48 or something like that. Okay. All right. Your years of service have to add 83. Have to add 83. So if we would limit this, or if we would set this at 65, that means I'd have to have 18 years. A minimum of 18 years? Yeah, you do that. That matches, right? That, that makes 83. Okay, that makes 83. So, so uh, I'm just looking at. And I think your vest. You would not have a full retirement at 18, but I think your vested in the system at 15. You're vested at 15 full retirement. And then we have the requirement that you have to start at 30. Nobody else older than 35 can start. Correct. So, so okay, yeah, we would meet all that. Great. Right. Right. All right. But, what do you Did I interrupt you? I mean, when, when I first test, saw it, I thought, wow. We could vote on a test. Age discrimination to me, but, you know, because you're setting something. And to me, I mean, the younger generations, uh, hopefully it will live longer. So it's 65 and nine. I myself would rather have testing requirements than an age limit. Because we might get a heavy hitter in here that's at 60 that maybe came from a bigger community being a, uh, a chief of some sort and wants to settle down in a smaller community that can carry himself for another, you know, 10 years, so he's seven. Yeah, I don't know. 
I, I don't know if I'm ready for But well, we can hold it and vote on the 10th or 11th, it would be the 10th, because the 10th's a, a holiday. No, the 10th is the 11th. It's the 11th, right? 10th is the next day. No, 11th is our The 9th is a holiday. The 10th is oh, okay. So we could do it then. It's up to you guys. I mean, I'm not ready to vote yet, but if you guys are, it's okay. It's Who is ready to vote? Three. <coughs> I think I could be ready on the 10th, I guess, and then move it directly from financial. Because we've never had an age limit in the city. This is, how long has the city been here? Yeah, no age limit. Uh, I just, okay. Yeah, there is no age limit now. But I, I look and should it be more than just those chiefs? What if we want to say it should be but somebody I, else? What if what if another position you say, well, geez, that's we should have an age limit on that? So maybe, maybe that's where we need to go. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know that. I just know like, that, oh, that as you go through right. the public it's sector, uh, yeah, and, really or if you go through the pri private industry, a lot of industries I know my company, the CEO has to retire at age 60. Uh, they won't let he, he or she stay on past the age of 60. Um, there's, so you say uh, it should be 60? Yeah, personally, yeah, I think so. But I, I can understand the argument to keep it at 65. So um, I, I can switch to that. I look at um, the, the airline pilots, they have to retire at 65. Uh, you look at some of the, the, the priests, they have to retire at 70. Okay. Priest? Yeah, priests do. Okay. All, all the federal law enforcement, the, the highway patrol for the state of Ohio, I don't know if it's 55 or do you know what Dave Lockman? 57. 57. So, you know, like like Ken Patterson. So he's what? he's the local commander. It doesn't matter if you're the colonel. When when that birthday comes. But I guess I would done. do the same thing with the mention about all of the. Why can't we pass an ordinance with all of them now, and then they know where we stand, and then when they go to collective bargaining, they know 65 is the age. I think. So okay, are you saying then for all city employees? No, no, I'm saying for all. All, all safety all, force. All safety Six force, right? I think maybe we should. I'm okay. With that. John, John, to answer the question, we then can be accused of an unfair right. labor, labor practice, practice by simply doing it without discussion. There's, there's a process that we have to follow. Why, and John is asked right. that we go to the council or the union. Well, how long does that take? Is that October 10th? You have that answer? It, it doesn't matter though. For I mean, we're that's we're trying to get the two positions that are open here. Or right. will be one. One's open. One's one. Did yeah. you pay anything? No, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the right. timeline is this. Right. This is the one that the timeline is on. But I, I've already told you that our interest is to do both police and fire. We just have to go through the, the processes. For well, I understand. I, I guess can't I, rush that. I want to. Yeah, I want to think. I mean, we just got it today. I mean, if it was important, maybe. We, I mean, I don't. Well, you got it, Fred. Okay. Yeah, we got it. Well, <laughs> 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 we wanted to give you guys a chance to tell us about it too. So, okay. take off and no, that's not me. Um, well, there's only three that want to vote today, so we yeah, should. Yeah, we can wait till the tenth. For the tenth. Now, now, the only issue with the tenth is I'm not going to be here. So, well, is Huber going to be here? He'll be here, right? Yeah, Huber. That might be wishful thinking. <laughs> All right. Well, is it, is it okay to wait to the tenth, or you guys want to try to? We don't have. And then okay. you're talking about. If if it if your finance does pass it, taking it to council on yeah, because we talked about it now with the emergency right, process. we talked about it now. But I guess the thing to think about is what age are we talking about? Because we that is the only question, ages. right? I mean, you got to check around. I mean, sixty five is offered. I mean, I don't. I guess I get, I always get hesitant because people are getting healthier longer. That's the mm -hmm. only question. I mean, maybe fifty five about thirty years ago may have been hey fifty five. Because when you were young, you think 55, you think that's old, but now it's all of a sudden young. <laughs> yeah, you got to keep in mind, too. <laughs> <laughs> you got to keep in mind, too, just because the, the mandatory re requirement would be 65 for our police and fire department. doesn't mean that when they retire here, they can go out and work. Right. <laughs> all right, well, everybody think about it, talk to whomever you'd like to talk about, and we can come back and figure out exactly where you want to head with that. We're getting a little pressure from the clerk of council. <laughs> um, section 15 discussion, raise medium barriers on 42. Patrick, you have an update. Yes, uh, last time we talked, we were going to get a price for the cost to upgrade to install stamped, uh, dyed and stamped concrete in those medium barriers on 42 and just the sections where they'll be three foot wide, which is where they approach the intersection. Did get some numbers from ODOT. There are five total islands. Two of them will be done this year, obviously, and three next year. These numbers are, are to do all of those. Uh, total cost is an additional 22500 approximately. Of that amount, ODOT will cover a little over 11000 So the city's total obligation, if we wanted to upgrade the diet and stamp concrete for the five islands, would be about 11500 
And do we have to come up with any additional new funds to cover that? No. Um, ODOT, you know, the way they code the project, you know, certain things like the water line was 100% cities. There's other items that we share costs. This would just be coded appropriately. And then after the project is closed out, they'll do the accounting and either we, more or more likely, we'll get a rebate because of, we should be under what we've already submitted. Potentially, we could get a little more if there's some change orders coming. That'll be a couple years down the road. Where does everybody think they want to do it? That's good. I'm good, I'm good with that. I'm good with it, too. Yeah, okay, nice everybody's good with it. Okay. You pick out the color and this no, no, pattern. No, no, exactly not the color. Black and gold. Okay. Okay. Uh, orange, orange. Blue and orange. Oh, okay. So that's my new side. favorite color. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Charlie. 17178, Green. accepting a warranty deed oh, from somebody. Green and white. Mr. Huber. Please don't. This right. is the second eminent domain case that we filed in connection with the bridge culvert on Harmony Street. Uh, we were able to resolve this, this case. Uh, the property owner, Ms. Shepard, graciously agreed to settle the claim. She signed a warranty deed that conveys to us a small section of property that allows this project to go forward. And the um, council needs to accept it in order to form it so that the, it may formally be city of Medina's property. With the emergency cost card? Uh, that probably makes sense because they're out there working on it now. <laughs> I moved to approve with the emergency cost. The second one included the emergency cost. Hey, Greg, what was the original number? Can you tell us that? Uh, that we offered? It was uh, 3500 All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Most curious. Anything else for finance? All right, let's put it down.